Thank you. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. And I'm going to start because we don't have a lot of time. And luckily, some of the topics have been already discussed before. So let's start with the general view. So step back before entering into the, the topic of energy storage. Uh, one of the challenges that we need to consider is that first, before even considering to produce more energy, we need to reduce the energy demand in terms of energy per capita. So what happened in the last decades uh, is the fact that with the increase of the gross domestic uh, uh, product and with the increase of population, the increase of energy demand, gro global primary energy demand uh, went up so on. Uh, but the point is that we need to decouple these two things. Otherwise, we will never reach our targets. We need to be more energy efficient. We need to reduce the energy demand per capita. So, of course, we, we hope that the GDP will continue to increase. We cannot control, I mean, the increase of the population. That's it. Uh, but definitely, and this is something that also has been underlined in the recent COP28, we need to be more energy efficient. We cannot otherwise make this uh, race forever. So this is one of the first challenges that we have. And by the way, you can already see that in terms of global primary energy demand, we have one third, one third, one third between transport, buildings and manufacturing. So it doesn't mean that we want to have less transport, less manufacturing, and less buildings per capita. We want to have them more efficient. So that's why we want to have, I don't know, the, the, the recent regulation regarding the uh, energy efficient buildings, net zero energy uh, buildings, the, uh, let's say, push, regulation push towards uh, electrical vehicles. Electrical motors are more efficient. We need to have the same wealth but reduce the energy demand per capita. So first challenge is this one. And then the other challenge is to move from a thermal energy model to an electrical energy model. So let's say that roughly speaking, today two thirds of the global primary energy are coming from thermal energy, so hydrocarbons. Uh, and we want to have in 2050, this is an, an outlook from uh, International Energy Agency, we want to, well, have the opposite. So I have at least two thirds of the global primary energy demand that is an electrical energy. Uh, so of course we cannot electrify everything because there are the, the well-known hard to abate sectors. So if you have uh, manufacturing sectors that need to have high uh, temperatures, so it could be the case of, uh, well, steel, concrete, glass, you see them there. Um, you, I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense to use electricity to reach high temperatures. So you need to, to think about other other uh, ways to decarbonize the, the system, could be with carbon capture solutions. But anyway, you cannot really think that everything can be electrified. Electrify as much as possible, but still you will have a remaining challenge. Okay, so of course, if you have 68% of the global primary energy demand coming from renewables, uh, you have non-programmable energy sources, and this starts to make some uh, challenges again. And focusing on electricity generation, you can see that electricity is expected to increase a lot in the next uh, three decades. And of course, you can see that the expectation uh, in the uh, increase rate of photovoltaics and wind mainly, uh, are astonishing, but still, 80% of the electrical grid will be um, will, will have electrons coming from renewables, non-programmable. So, of course, previous speaker already mentioned that you can have grid stability issues and balancing issues between demand and production. So, uh, this is just a, a real-world case. So, in California, in 2018, we already had what is called the dock curve. So the dark curve is a, a plot when you, where you have the demand, daily demand, minus the renewable electrical production. So, of course, this curve comes from the fact that you have at noon the peak uh, photovoltaic production. California has a lot of photovoltaic, uh, a lot of photovoltaics. So it comes out with this dark curve. And if you go even uh, beyond this 2018 graph and California had a fast deployment of photovoltaics. Now you are having something like this. So it looks more like a canyon curve. So at noon, you are able to cover entirely the uh, electrical demand only through renewables, for instance, through the photovoltaics. 
but then of course you have the remaining hours of the day that needs to be covered. So again, this is the, the, the Kaizo plot year after year, and you see that year after year with increase of photovoltaic deployment, you have a decrease uh, in, in this curve. So this is the net demand again. So what does it mean? Uh, economically speaking, I mean, you, you have a market rule that when the offer is more than the uh, demand, uh, the price go down. So it means that uh, at noon, you have electricity prices that can be zero or even negative. So it doesn't mean that for me, for the, the final customer, I'm going to be paid if I use electricity at noon, of course. But if I'm an electrical producer, it doesn't make for me any economical value to produce at noon. So if you want to go uh, with other, uh, go on with other installations of photovoltaics, well, you, you need to be careful because there could be curtailments or there could be no economical cases uh, in doing so. So this is a quite extreme case because I would say that California doesn't have, well, a, a, a very wide technological mix, but still, let's see what how they are going to manage this. So again, this is California and this is a, a plot from two months ago. So what happened is that, okay, you have the, the, the um, request for energy. Uh, in Early in the morning, a lot of energy is coming from imports. And then the rest will come a little bit from nuclear, geothermal, but mainly from hydro, wind, and natural gas. Then you have sunrise, you have a lot of yellow, so a lot of photovoltaics. But then you see that the photovoltaics is, is limited at the bottom at noon because what you are having right now already, and this is two months ago, so it's not the future, it's today, you already are having uh, so many batteries in the system, and mainly those are standalone battery energy storage systems. So they are directly interfaced with the grid and you're moving the, the peak. Okay, so like the, the previous speaker said, you, you are time shifting the photovoltaic production to cover the evening demand. And what is well interesting to see is that at 8 p.m. batteries were the main uh, power source for the California grid. So this is the first time that it happens. So batteries are more than natural gas, more than hydro, more than everything else. Uh, quite interesting. It means that in California, you have a lot of business cases, not only uh, well, possibilities. It's a reality right now. So it's a quite extreme market. And we cannot take this as a general rule because every country is different in terms of electrical mix. Um, but it's quite interesting to see that it is happening today. Another point, so we have generation, we have demand, and we have the possibility to match these two words. Of course, energy storage is one way to do so, but please do not focus exclusively on energy storage. So it's not only a matter of having a certain demand today, having a certain way of producing electricity, and try to adapt the production to the, the demand. It's not only this. Of course, today we are going to focus on energy storage, but it's one option because we have also other options that are possible. So I'm just give you I'm just giving you some snapshots, but keep them in mind. You do not have to focus exclusively on one way. This is a complex problem. We are moving towards a renewable world and we have great complexities. So do not focus exclusively on on one possible way to solve the problem. So one interesting way. These are less mature uh, approaches, but you are researchers, so please keep this in mind. There could be something like the implicit storage, like this is called. So as renewables are cheap, we are decarbonizing the world. We want to have the world decarbonized, but the reality um, is the fact that photovoltaics and wind are increasing today, not because we are focusing on CO2 reduction, but because Today, they are the most economical way to produce electricity. So last year, 95% of new capacity additions were photovoltaics or wind because they are competitive without any kind of subsidies, without any kind of tenders, without any kind of further push of the technology. We had some pushes of the technologies in the previous decades, but now we are having renewables, finally, I would add, because they are competitive. So the point is that as they are cheap, can we exploit this aspect? I mean, if I install overcapacity 
more capacity that it is needed. If I have, regulatory speaking, a way to uh, um, give a remuneration for uh, self curtainment of renewables, I can better manage the grid complexity. So let's say that I have a 100 megawatt photovoltaic plant. If I get uh, a fair remuneration, I can make my plant operate at 50 megawatt and then have a ramp up and ramp down possibility. I'm not adding any kind of energy storage system, but I'm making my system flexible and the grid accepts that and I can get paid for that. Okay, so it's a different business case and this is called um, implicit storage. So you see, this is the levelized cost of electricity. Uh, uh, if I don't have any kind of proactive curtailment, I would need a lot of energy storage in the system to have a fully decarbonized grid. And as we said before, energy storage systems for today cost a lot and not always make a reasonable business case. So this could be an interesting compromise. It's something, of course, that needs to have governments involved, uh, well, fair remuneration and compensation for these uh, different business model cases. But you see, it's interesting to see that in the sector, uh, some groups are targeting the problem from a different point of view. Other aspects, there was a question regarding this. So demand management, very interesting. Again, if I'm not able to continue, um, let's say, managing the production part to match the demand part of the problem, let's try to change the demand. So if I get, again, a fair remuneration and I'm an industrial operator, I can accept to shift my peak consumption um, to better match my load profile with the production profile. Of course, I'm not making it spontaneously as long as I do not have a, an economical advantage for that, but definitely this is a, a very clever way to adapt the grid to what is the main technologies for today. Because here, well, this is an example with wind. Probably it's better to have it with photovoltaics because um, let's say having the demand response shifted to the, to the daily hours for photovoltaics is easier to understand. Uh, but this is a very important aspect. So again, consider the possibility to have a better a value for the grid uh, by acting on another uh, aspect. And another point, I mean, if really we are moving toward the, the electrification of the mobility and we are going to have millions of electrical vehicles and most of the time these electrical vehicles are unused and parked in the garage, in a, in a parking lot, why not uh, exploiting the millions of batteries that are distributed in my uh, country? If I connect them and I'm a, an owner of an electrical vehicle, I get remuneration for that, I can permit to the uh, distributor to act on my battery. So have them charge or discharge the battery to match the request from the grid. So this is what is called the vehicle to grid. And consider that, I don't know, I show you California. Let's let's say make some trivial math. If you have 2 million cars in California and you have 50 kilowatt hours of batteries, you have 100 gigawatt hours of energy storage distributed in, in California. So if 10% of them accept to have a remuneration and uh, uh, well, give access to these 10 gigawatt hours of energy storage, I do not need to install 10 gigawatt hours of energy storage in the grid to make the grid reliable. So it's something that is a win-win solution, I think, and definitely in terms of regulatory and, and, and norms, we need to move towards this direction because it's a, it's a perfect match. So now move to energy storage. So th there hasn't been a lot of needs for energy storage up to now. So uh, electricity was produced and was consumed, dot. So now that we are having a lot of non-programmable uh, renewables and we want to have a lot of electrification, we need to have a way to store electricity. Um, so of course, power needs, energy needs. This is written very little, uh, very small, I know. So I don't like the much, that much this slide. I'm going to skip it. But the point is that it is now that we are facing this problem. Batteries were things that were 
limited to portable devices to till few years ago, really. And we are adopting mainly these kind of batteries for stationary storage. So it not necessarily is the, 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 the best way to, to face this, this issue. In terms of technologies, I think that a lot of things has been already said. You have hydro, that is the main uh, energy storage system as for today, compressed air, very mature, but a uh, few very, very site specific and in few cases in the world, better energy storage. You have different behaviors in terms of discharge duration and, and the uh, typical power of the plant. And this is for, uh, for the, the installation. So as for today, lots of installation are pumped hydro, but I would say that the vast majority of the new installation are lithium ion batteries, not electrochemical, but really lithium ion batteries. So in terms of electrochemical storage, the, the mainstream, the established technology is lithium ion. Today as for stationary storage is lithium iron phosphate. There is also nickel, manganese, cobalt, and so on, and, and some variations. But the point is that it is, as for today, the best compromise that we have. I don't want to say that it is uh, uh, the best technology that we could have, but as for today, it has no competitors for what are the current needs of the grids. So you have other emerging technologies. Some are, have been around for, for some years. Some are quite new. Uh, sodium sulfur batteries, for instance, are already at a commercial level, but I mean, they, they lost the competition with lithium. So they didn't have a lot of additional value proposition with respect to lithium ion. So you see in terms of cycle life, less than lithium. In terms of energy density, less than lithium. Lifespan, does it make a difference? Not so much. I mean, today really you have lithium ion and that's it. The other technologies are fighting to have a different value proposition for some business specific cases, but lithium ion has a very interesting uh, levelized cost of storage or levelized cost of electricity because they reach at volumes and they reach at volumes because of the electrical vehicle sector, not because of the stationary uh, applications. So we are already exploiting a, a supply chain and the maturity in manufacturing that make these cases, well, the, the, the fall of 90% in the cost that uh, uh, the previous speaker showed you is coming from the, 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 the electrical vehicle sector, not from, from stationary storage uh, and renewables and so on. So this is a, Let's say a side benefit, I would say. So in terms of stationary utility scale, uh, battery energy storage systems, of course, you start from batteries, you have modules, racks, you combine them, you have cabinets, uh, could be for residential application or containers for utility scale applications. But it's not only a matter of batteries, you have more than that, because then you need to have, of course, also the inverter, because the batteries are in DC and you need to have an interfacement with the grid that is in, in AC, so a power conversion system together with a power um, uh, controller. Uh, the battery management system typically is provided together with the batteries by the manufacturer uh, itself. And then you have the, the low to medium voltage connection, uh, et cetera. You need to manage in a stationary utility scale uh, storage system, also the safety aspects, the thermal management. And most of all, a complex matter is the, um, let's say energy management system that you need to put in place to exploit in terms of, of uh, economical benefits at best your asset. So the market logics, and tools that you need to apply to exploit at best what is the capability of the energy storage system to to make energy transit in and out of the battery are quite complex and uh, change time from time and from market to market of course so well i don't want to to, to dedicate a lot of time in, in, on this point but you have a lot of stuff to consider when you want to to procure an energy storage system uh, I would say that the cycling strategy is something quite interesting because um, let's say you you have two kinds of degradation in electrochemical batteries. You have a cycle aging and um, well, an, an annual aging. So uh, what happens is that typically for lithium ion, uh, I mean, I think that in my previous slide there was this. Okay, so you see cycle life is the number of cycles that are under warranty from your uh, provider. So if I make one cycle per day, 6,000 cycles mean that I'm having a system that in terms of 
uh, cycle life can last 20 years, 18 years, something like that, so a lot. So what comes before, in fact, is the lifespan. So uh, you have then also the other warranty that is on the, uh, let's say, aging of the system itself. So um, if I have one cycle per day, typically uh, I'm going to have problems more on the lifespan. I mean, before on the lifespan and later on on the, the cycle life. Uh, but then this means that in terms of cycling strategy, I have some room to extract more value from my asset. So if I have not only time shifting, that means one cycle per day. If I have a combination with PV or I have a, a market where I have a lot of PV, I can easily charge my battery at noon and discharge it in the evening. But this means one cycle per day. But if I add on top of that also, I don't know, frequency regulation, I can have equivalent cycles that are higher. So that makes my battery degrade first. But if I have room for that, of course, this is a premium in the business case that you are uh, developing. Okay, uh, calendar aging and cycle aging. We already mentioned that. The cycle aging is dependent on your use of the battery, okay? And uh, it's quite complex to understand if you have a business case because the batteries can last, okay? They can last, the technology advances a lot. It can last uh, 10, 15 years and so on. But the problem is that the market is changing. So uh, even if I have an asset that's under warranty and with, uh, well, proven uh, field uh, uh, applications that can last a lot, it, I'm not sure, completely sure that the business case is sustainable because 10 years from now, probably the market prices will be completely different. So it's a risk that you have in developing, especially standalone energy storage system interfaced with the grid. Uh, so having some uh, possibility to adapt your business case over the years and consider modeling of cycle aging versus state of health uh, versus use case is quite important. And this is digital stuff. So it's not really technology. You are doing things like, I mean, artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms, these kind of things, but this is needed for your business. Uh, one economical aspect of lithium ion that is the, the dominant technologies for today is the fact that it is a modular uh, energy storage system. That means that, okay, uh, there are some parts of the system that have a cost that is a unit cost in euro per kilowatt, but the battery has a, a unit cost that is more related to the euro per kilowatt hour. So I cannot really, in, and, and I make things clearer. In lithium ion electrochemical storage system, you cannot really decouple the power from the energy. So if I increase the duration of my system, I just need to put down more batteries. If I want to have two hours duration, okay, I put one battery rack. If I want to have four hours duration instead of two, I'm going to double the number of modules. That's it. I'm, I'm not going to change the, the, the power part of the problem. So I still have one single inverter, but I'm doubling my capacity by just putting down more batteries. That means that I'm not exploiting any kind of, um, let's say, a scale advantage. OK, so if I ask for a longer duration, I'm just doubling the CapEx cost, roughly speaking. OK. So at first, you see that I have an advantage. If I move from two hours to four hours, and then a little bit from four hours to two to six hours, the levelized cost, um, I mean, the sorry, the, the CapEx cost in terms of dollar per kilowatt hour are decreasing because in fact, I'm decreasing the inverter part, so the power part. But then if I'm over six hours and I want to, to double the duration, I'm going to double my CapEx. So the unit cost will remain the same. So this is a limitation because it means that lithium ion started with, as, a, as a battery storage technology that gave you 30 minutes of duration, then moved to 45, then still two hours, doesn't have any competitor. Four hours, still it's the most advantage solutions for today. But when I'm, I'm reaching six, eight, 10 hours, I'm not sure that lithium is still so competitive. OK, because there is this simple aspect. I mean, I need to put down more batteries. So uh, of course, I'm uh, adding uh, uh, material and I'm adding uh, uh, cost and complexity to the system. So there could be other technological solutions uh, that are more 
let's say more technic technical ad technically adaptable to longer duration uh, but still it's hard it's hard to compete with lithium because the, the volumes are there and really if the cost continue to decrease we had the stress in the supply chain a couple of years ago but lithium is not a rare material it's a critical material so you need them you you need people to extract lithium at a higher rate okay but it's not true that lithium is rare okay so there is a bottleneck in today's uh, uh, supply chain but still it is something that is manageable so i'm i i don't have my crystal ball with me today but <laughs> i don't know if eight hours ten hours still make business case sustainable for lithium but this is this intrinsic limitation so let's focus a little bit on the applications and the market outlook so of course you have off-grid applications but i'm not going to speak today as for um regarding off-grid application uh, i'm more uh, concentrated on grid connected application that could be residential commercial and industrial and utility scale doesn't change a lot i would say that just a matter of scale uh, but business cases um, are different so in terms of technologies i would say that batteries doesn't doesn't know where they are going to be so it's the same battery just have more modules i would say okay so in terms of um, annual deployments this is from wood mckenzie similar to the bloomberg that has been showed before uh, what is interesting to to focus on is the fact that from well last year two years ago uh, to 2032 so 10 years from now the market does not expect to have really longer duration so you see, we are, we're coming from two hours duration in the market and on average, of course, there will be room for, for long duration, but on average, 10 years from now, still we are at three hours duration. So this is a, an outlook. It could be a chicken and egg problem. So it could be that you don't have a business case because you don't have the technology that makes your business case sustainable. So nobody's asking for six, eight, 10 hours because Lithium is not able to give you a sustainable business case for that. Or it could be that really you don't have applications. I mean, seasonal storage is even more extreme than that. Now I'm speaking about few hours storage, but the reality is that the outlooks of uh, that we have are not really giving you a lot of six hour duration potential up to now. But then of course we need to, to well, we are researchers, so we need to have a, uh, a look to the to the future and markets so again I, I said grid scale commercial and industrial residential every country has a different uh, approach to energy storage so there are countries that uh, are prioritizing some needs and others are making things different so let's say that grid scale um, is the main way to to do uh, have a deployment of energy storage systems in us china and united kingdom instead you are having a lot of uh, commercial and industrial in india mainly for decarbonization reasons so they want to time shift to have a let's say sort of an electrical base load for decarbonization purposes and we are having in italy and also in germany and in japan a lot of push on the residential aspect so this is for distributed generation so you see it's not a very um, uniform scenario that you're having globally speaking so you have different potential of different technologies also and different business cases depending on the country in italy for instance we had a lot of um, economical incentives for the government to promote uh, residential installations uh, of course, the, 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 let's say the, the big slice of the cake is on the utility scale uh, systems, I would say. But as for today, you see that it is quite diversified. So utility scale, uh, utility scale again, uh, consider that energy storage system can be by themselves, so standalone and uh, perfect, interesting business case or combined with photovoltaic or wind. Let's say that current energy storage systems are more uh, properly combined with PV because if I have two, three, four, even six hours of energy storage, okay, I have a perfect match with photovoltaics that has a, a diurnal dependence, so daily up and down uh, production. Instead, if I have a wind farm, it can give me, let's say, top production for 
uh, six days in a row and then nothing for one week, I don't have an energy storage system that is able for com to compensate for that. So I would say that uh, mainly you have combination of PV and uh, and energy storage system, electrochemical energy storage system, not so much wind and electrical uh, energy storage system. And then of course you have commercial and industrial for self-consumption. So you need to, to, to reduce your your bill, uh, but still you also want to, to decarbonize yourself. And as for residential, it's more mainly bill management. So the most complex use cases are the, the utility case, utility scale cases, because then I'm going to talk a, a little bit about that. But ancillary service, like has been mentioned before, like frequency regulation or other, or other stuff and arbitrage, so trading of energy are quite complex uh, and need to be considered to have a a proper business case. So as for utility scale, again, standalone or integrated with a PV or wind. Of course, you have some advantages uh, if you already have the interconnection of the, the PV plant and if your business model is also related to the fact that I'm avoiding curtailment of my uh, renewable power plant. So if I have a peak production and typically in that specific uh, market node, uh, the operator curtails me at noon because there is too much wind or too much PV, I can have an interesting business case by saving this energy in my energy storage system and postponing it with, well, just an advantage in that. And okay, I, I don't have time to enter into all these details, but you have power application and energy application. The point is that if you have a look of the recent uses of stationary utility scale, you see that a lot of revenues were generated by ancillary services. So not really from time shifting or from energy arbitrage, but really having uh, me paid by the grid operator because I'm providing frequency regulation, because I'm providing other kind of um, um, sustain to the grid. Uh, but recently, you see in 2024, this is a global picture. Of course, it depends a lot on the country where you you are making this consideration, but you see that you are starting to have interesting energy trading revenues or capacity revenues. So, for instance, if you see California, I showed you in one of my first slide, California, you can make a, a suitable business case there exclusively through energy trading. I'm just charging my battery when it doesn't cost me anything and I'm selling electricity to the grid when uh, the, the sun goes down. Uh, so it depends a lot and different countries are facing this aspect in different ways. The curtailment is still not a big deal. You know what curtailment is, by the way? OK, so curtailment is not a, a reality in, in most of the markets today. It is starting to be an issue in some countries. So Texas, uh, California, a little bit in Spain could be something critical in Greece. Up to now, not in Italy, but I mean, of course, if you increase the, the, the renewables share, curtailment could become an issue. And I'm not got, I, I mean, as long as I don't have in place the implicit storage that I mentioned before. So if I, if I do not get a remuneration for my self curtailment, I've been curtailed and I'm losing money. That's it. So if in those cases, I'm considering to put an additional energy storage system is just to maintain my business case. So it's a cost, but I'm happy to have it if I'm losing money because of curtailment. Uh, the point is that in terms of ancillary markets, so let's say more power oriented applications, the main markets are becoming saturated. So there, are, there, there were already a lot of uh, tenders for that. So probably in the next years, there will be more room in terms of, uh, well, economical advantages in the capacity, uh, firm capacity offers or energy trading and less on the ancillary services. OK, different countries are uh, approaching the problem in different ways. In Italy, we are going to have tenders for standalone better energy storage systems. So uh, let's say a fixed premium that will come from the government. So I'm there risking completely my business case. So I'm just giving the technology to the, the grid operator, let's put it this way, and they are paying me a flat tariff that uh, is coming from a tender, of course, but I don't have the risk of electricity market prices variation over the next 10 years. So this is one way that is very centralized. So uh, let's say top down. 
uh, but you can have also, uh, let's say, other regulatory aspects. I don't know if you already touched these aspects, but hybrid auctions here are intended not hybridization between energy storage systems, but hybridization of renewable power plant with energy storage systems. So in some countries in Spain and in Portugal, they are giving you, um, um, let's say, more flexibility in adding in retrofit energy storage systems where you already are having wind farms or, or PV power plants. So, I mean, different ways to, um, to manage the, the, the problem. In terms of duration, uh, as I said before, what, is, what could be the need of long duration system when I'm going to need more duration? So, this is a graph from NRL, I think. Um, but uh, again, you, you see, I'm, I'm shifting my needs of longer durations towards higher values when I'm increasing the renewable uh, share in the grid. So as for today, we are, let's say, four hours less than that. The range six, 12, hour, 12 hours, sometimes it is already considered long duration energy storage. There is not a strict definition. I mean, long duration can be intended as over six hours, over eight hours, over 12 hours. I haven't seen any standard in that. So uh, let's say that's what is over six hours is medium long <laughs> duration, something like that. Uh, but still, you have risky business cases, but you need them. So again, different countries are trying to push the market of energy storage installation because they are going to be needed, because the, the, the rate of deployment of renewables doesn't stop. So in very few years, I'm going to move from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 percent of renewable energy um, in, injected into the grid. And the, if the energy storage operators doesn't put energy storage systems uh, connected to the grid at a certain point, I need to stop things and it's not good. I need to have a parallel deployment of these two, two aspects. And then what about seasonal storage? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, it's hard to say if we we'll ever have a, a business case sustainable for ultra long duration. So let's say over a hundred hours. Uh, it's it's critical because as you said before, there was a, a question, you have a lot of capex and you are cycling your energy storage system, how many times? 10 times per year. So in terms of levelized cost of storage, I'm cycling my system few times per year. The energy uh, is, if I normalize to the energy that is transiting through the energy storage system, it's complex. It's complex. So of course there is hydro. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't have my, the, the answer with me. Of course, pumped hydro and compressor. There are some proven ways to do that. Converting completely the problem with uh, green hydrogen could be a solution. Could be that uh, carbon capture uh, combined with uh, gas turbine is sustainable economically speaking. It is arguable as for today, but let's see in 2050 uh, what kind of competition we can have. But I, let's say that in the next decades, it's hard to see any technology and any business case for seasonal storage. So it will be more a matter of uh, energy mix. So let's try to mix the different vectors, not focus exclusively on photovoltaics, otherwise you have a big risk. Mix wind and, and PV, mix with, with other stuff, so you'll have a, a more uh, reasonable value. So this is the outlook for some specific countries. You can see what kind of uh, renewable share I can have in the next decades. So it could be that the equivalent energy storage duration will increase a little bit. And this is for the case for the United States. You see 12 hours could be through pumped hydro, but I mean, in 2050, still NRL doesn't see an increase in the need of ultra long duration in, in USA markets. So final slide, this one. I said that there is no competition uh, with lithium up to four, six hours. If I go up to 12 hours, the competition is open. It's more a matter of having a very low capex and a, a sustainable business case, but competition is fully, is fully open. So other um, solutions like gravity storage, compressed air, adiabatic compressed air, I would say, uh, or thermal storage that has been discussed uh, today can make their, their um, 
I mean, the value proposition for uh, long duration energy storage system. The point is more when are we going to really need to see deployment of this kind of energy storage systems? Uh, I don't know. As for today, we don't see a lot of needs in the next years for these ultra long duration systems. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.